Ladies and gentlemen, His Excellency. Hölgyeim és Uraim, Ő Excellenciája, Benjamin Netanyahu, Izrael Állam. And His Excellency, Mr. Viktor Orbán, Prime Minister of Hungary, are coming. Thank you, Prime Minister Orbán, for uh, inviting me to Hungary and to the Visegrad Summit. And I'm delighted to be with you and all your uh, ministers and your associates. I'm happy to have brought here uh, MK, member of Knesset, uh, Eichler, uh, and uh, of course our delegation, our ambassador who is here, and uh, the various uh, business people from Israel uh, and Hungary. They already know that Hungary is a good deal. They already know. So we are uh, uh, here, uh, going from here to uh, uh, the birthplace of uh, Theodor Herzl. So Zionism, the movement for the modern Jewish state, uh, was born in Hungary. And without uh, Herzl's genius, we wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be here today. And I think the Jewish people's uh, fortunes would have been very, very different. When Herzl began, uh, uh, his uh, ideas at the age of 36, and he died at uh, 44, that's all, eight years. He began talking about a Jewish state, uh, eventually a Jewish army, and so on, and, uh, you know, everybody said to him, you're crazy. Dr. Herzl, you're crazy. So he heard it often enough, and he thought, well, just to be on the safe side, maybe I am crazy. So he went to talk to a friend of his who was also a Hungarian Jew. His name was Max Nordau. Nordau was uh, the greatest, one of the greatest intellects of the late 19th century. Uh, he wrote a book predicting the uh, failures of uh, socialism and communism in, 18, in the 1890s. So he heard uh, Theodor Herzl, and uh, he said, uh, my friend Theodor, you may be mad, but if you're mad, so am I. And the partnership of these two Hungarian Jews uh, launched the movement that ultimately culminated in the Jewish state. So we have a special uh, feeling for Hungary. And by the way, it's reinforced by many directions. But yesterday, I went to visit uh, Hapoel Beersheva, which is our national champions that are playing tonight. <clears throat> Sorry? <laughs> OK. <laughs> so you know, and where do I go? I see the Pushkas Stadium. So I remember Pushkas, you know. I remember many years ago, Pushkas. There are two things I remember about football when I grew up. I remember Pele later. I remember Pushkas. I also remember when an Israeli uh, uh, football player scored a goal against Yashin. That's about all I remember. So Hungary, Hungary has, there is a natural sympathy and a natural association between Hungary and Israel. Uh, I think it's being reflected in, the, uh, in this uh, room. Uh, but there is another connection. Uh, as uh, Prime Minister Orban described, uh, I think it's about 12 years ago, something like that, came to Israel and he said, so what can I learn from your experience? I had been finance minister and prime minister before. And I, I said to him, and I'll say this to you too, you think that technology is first. You think that mathematicians and computer engineers or mechanical engineers or doctors are first. They're very important, but they're not first. They're second. Now, I'll prove it to you. There was a country that had the best mathematicians, the best physicists, the best metallurgists in the world. But that country was very poor. It's called the Soviet Union. But when you took one of these mathematicians or physicists, you smuggled them or got them out, you put them on a plane, and you brought them to Palo Alto, within two weeks, they were producing added value that could produce great wealth. What comes first is markets. What comes first is markets. If you have great technology without markets, without a market-friendly economy, you'll get nowhere. But if you have a market-friendly economy, sooner or later the market forces will give you the technology you want. This was the main thing that uh, 
I try to uh, bring to the Israeli economy in my own way. The Israeli economy began as a very closed economy. Victor and I were speaking last night, and I asked him, what changed your view? I mean, grew up under a communist system. He said, well, I got to the university, and somebody showed me the, uh, the professor that influenced you. Uh, you know, I read, uh, when I was 16 years old, I read Ayn Rand, so I decided everything has to be libertarian. By the time I was 21, I got rid of it, grew out of it. But I read Milton Friedman, I read Friedrich von Hayek, and I said they're more right where they are than the other people, they're wrong. It's got to be a certain balance, but it has to tilt towards markets. Markets come first. And therefore, what we did, and the experience that you asked me, was basically to free up the economy, to get people to the labor force, to reduce the amount of government control of the economy, and to, uh, to encourage competition and privatization, many other things. This wasn't easy to do. I say this because then I watched what you did. And you enacted many, many reforms. And some of them, you're ahead of us. Labor mobility, I think you're ahead of us. It's very important. Uh, and I think we can learn from each other. But it's very clear, to, and there are also limitations. There are always non-market considerations that guide national policy. And I don't want to, uh, I'm not going back to being 16 years old. But what happened in Israel is a transformation from a, a, a truly controlled economy to a freer, free market or freer market economy. And the same thing happened here in Hungary under you, uh, Victor, and we can see the rise of both economies. Now comes the element of technology. Assuming you have uh, relatively free markets, then technology becomes ascendant. And in Israel, um, First of all, we don't dictate anything. There are a lot of businesses, real estate, uh, uh, many, many other consumer services that are not yet high tech, but they do very well. Consumption in Israel is growing at, uh, what, 5% a year? 5% a year. Not bad. Uh, so obviously these are, these are very good uh, businesses and some of them are here and they should continue. The markets dictate what works. I don't dictate. I don't uh, pretend to dictate, but we do see the development of technology. The only place where I've actually intervened in the market, except uh, you know, building infrastructure, building roads, building fast fiber, things of that sort. But where did we actually intervene in a business only in one area? Cybersecurity. Do you want to put on uh, cyber, what we've done with cyber? Because we know that the internet economy is going to grow anyway and it's going to grow geometrically. So we started investing in cybersecurity, and this is the percentage that Israel receives from global cyber investment. You see 2016, private global investment in cybersecurity in Israel is 20% of the world investment. This is 200 times the size of Israel in the um, world population. We're investing in cyber because it's sunk cost. In other words, we pay for our equivalent of the NSA. Uh, I decided, can you put the Beersheba uh, Center? I decided that we'll move our NSA right to this place. This is 100 meters from uh, Ben Gurion University in the Negev. There is a university, our NSA, and this cyber spark. It's called Cyber Park. And the greatest companies in cybersecurity in the world are going to the Israeli Negev desert because they want to have, be able to partake of these, uh, of these talents that we encourage. We encourage them to go in. We also gave, uh, we gave certain credits. Uh, the first time that I actually intervene in a certain industry because I know how important this is for national security and for our economy. Uh, I, had a, I went there t on a visit with, uh, <coughs> with Steve Forbes, Forbes magazine. So I wanted to show him all these uh, entrepreneurs you know, young Israelis who are building now businesses in uh, Beersheba and cybersecurity. And uh, I see somebody maybe 25 years old, very, uh, uh, you know, very young, but he looks to be very familiar. And I say to him, uh, he's one of these companies. I say to him, uh, you look familiar. 
He says, Prime Minister, I was your NSA briefer. I said, oh, yes, right, correct. I said, so what are you doing now? He says, now? And he looks at me like this, now? Now I'm rich. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's important that the companies can be rich and the individuals can actually gain for their talent and their investments. And the risk, very important. Otherwise, you can have these brilliant people, but they won't go anywhere. And the economy won't grow anywhere. Markets first, technology second. Combination has given Israel great possibilities, great possibilities in many, many areas that I won't enumerate here. I think that it makes sense for countries, two countries like ours, Hungary and Israel, that have moved the economy forward on market principles to now join forces on technology and business in general. I don't limit it. I think you can make those decisions much better than uh, uh, this prime minister and Hungary's prime minister. You know your business better than we know your business. Do what's good for business. Our role is to make sure, one, that we don't interfere with you, and second, that we help you to the extent that we can. We've decided to uh, form a group for technological cooperation <coughs> to advance certain things, and I want to make clear what, what it is that we mean by this. We have uh, growing demand in Israel in our high-tech uh, business. We cannot supply the demand because we're running into limitations of personnel. We are, there are so many computer engineers that we can have. There are so many mathematicians and so on. Uh, we're trading more in Israel. But I thought that it would be a good idea to invite computer engineers, mathematicians, uh, software people from uh, Hungary, from Visegrad countries, to come and do an internship in Israel, which is very similar to what happened to Israeli, uh, uh, Israeli entrepreneurs who first went to work in Silicon Valley. They went to Silicon Valley. They absorbed the culture. They learned what to do with these startups. And they came back and started their own. And I think that we can hit, we can solve two problems here. This is a specific idea that we're discussing of bringing uh, very talented Hungarians, young men and women from Hungary and from the other Visegrad countries to Israel for a limited time period. And then they can go back and start their own. And you will have the Israeli partners for high tech, for anything in business, I think this is a natural partnership. This is a great friendship. This can uh, blossom. It is blossoming, and I think it will be for the benefit of both of countries. But the one thing that I learned, markets first, technology second. The combination is great. Combination of Hungary and Israel is great. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. <laughs>